Hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, have you. Have you handed over? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and we'll post actually we'll post that to Slack as well the the advertisement for the um, Heidegger Circle. Um, so for this section uh, session I should say uh, in section two of the Heraclitus lectures of 1944. Heidegger continues to prepare the way for our thinking through the notion of Logos and Heraclitus by considering the relationship between thinking and logic in terms of the related meanings of episteme and techne. As Heidegger explains, techne is related to the root word teko, ticto, commonly translated as to create. What is created is totechnon, the child. Ticto means to create. Indeed, it means to beget as well as to bear. But for the most part, it means the latter. In our mother tongue or the German mother tongue, this bearing creating is expressed by the beautiful and not yet fully comprehended turn of phrase to bring into the world. The proper and most concealed Greek meaning of teko is not making or manufacturing, but is rather the bringing forth of something into the unconcealed by the human so that it may presence there in the unconcealed as something that has, that, that has been thus brought forth so that it may shine out of its unconcealed and be in the sense the Greeks understood it. Immediately we're reminded of Heidegger's thinking about techne as a mode of aletheoe from his 1924-1925 Marburg lectures on Plato's Sophist, uh, which begins with the discussion of the five modes of aletheoe in Aristotle's Nicoma uh, Nicomachean Ethics. Our plan over the next two sessions is to work on the main section this week, and then we can start exploring the two review session, uh, sections next week. What I plan to do in this introduction is simply foreground Heidegger's discussion of the relation of episteme and techne in GA55 in terms of his earlier elucidation of this relationship from GA19 in 1924-1925. So in this earlier text, Heidegger determines the five modes of aletheoe in Aristotle as Naus, Sophia, Episteme, Phrenesis, and Techne. Techne is, according to Heidegger, know-how in taking care, manipulating and producing, which can develop in different degrees, as for example, with the shoemaker and the tailor. It is not the manipulating and producing itself, it is a mode of knowledge, precisely the know-how which guides the poiesis. Techne has to do with things which first have to be made and which are not yet what they will be. How though does Techne function as a mode of, of aletheoe? In GA19, Heidegger likens the activity of Techne to 2K, which is here in Aristotle characterized as the accidental. And so therefore 2K uh, and Techne in a certain sense have to do with the same things. Heidegger says the essential characteristic of the accidental is that what emerges from, uh, from it is out of its hands. The same occurs in the case of Techne. It may be developed in the most minute detail, and yet it does not have at its disposal with absolute certainty the success of the work. In the end, the ergon is out of, ha out of the hands of techne. Here we see, he says, a fundamental deficiency in the aletheoene which characterizes techne. In our present text, though, in J55, Heidegger says, techne is what pertains, pertains intimately to all bringing forth in the sense of human setting forth. If bringing forth techne is the setting into the unconcealed, i.e. the world, then techne means the knowledge of the unconcealed and the ways of attaining, obtaining and implementing it. The essential feature of bringing forth is techne and the essential feature of techne is to be the relation with unconcealment and to unfold that relatedness. Thus techne does not mean a type of activity in the sense of an effective, uh, in, in, in the sense of an affecting of bringing forth, but rather a preparing beforehand and keeping ready of the respective realm of the unconcealed into which something is brought forth and set forth, namely what is to be set forth. This preparing beforehand and keeping ready of the unconcealed, the alathes, that is of the true, is techne. Slightly later in the text, Heidegger says of Phusis, Phusis is also understood in an, in an analogous way as the process of self-becoming, as the process by which something brings itself from itself into its form and its outward look. Clearly in this way, Heidegger is thinking about techne in a far deeper sense compared to his assessment of techne in Aristotle in 1924. Likewise, Heidegger seemingly thinks through the relation of techne and episteme 
in a more concentrated sense in 1943 uh, compared to that which he set out in 1924. In his discussion of Aristotle, he says, techne, because it possesses the logos and can provide information about what is present in regard to its origin, or I suppose uh, unfolding, uh, uber das seiende in seine uh, herkunft, is taken to be malon episteme than uh, empiria. In this way, the genesis of Sophia, techne draws near to episteme. It is even designated as episteme in techne. Oh, as episteme. In techne, episteme is most properly, properly harnessed to an intention to fabricate. But techne also contains a tendency to liberate itself from handling things and to become an autonomous episteme. In the Heraclitus lecture, Heidegger's characterization of the relation of episteme and techne is, is conceived in a far more fundamental sense. He writes, it would be erroneous if we were to think that episteme techne as a type of knowledge were to account for, as is commonly said, the theoretical side of practical doing, making, and executing. One may see how crooked and confusing the thinking of this view is if one looks to the fact that for the Greeks, the theoretical, the theorem, is the highest form of action itself. Of what use then is our thoughtless and groundless differentiation between the theoretical and the practical? The still veiled essential feature of the essence of episteme and techne consists in their relation to the unconcealment of what is and what can be. Episteme, the understanding of something, and techne, the knowledge of something, are so near to one another in essence that very often one, one word stands in for the other. This was already the case in the ancient Greek world. Indeed, it is through ancient Greece that, the, that an essential connection between all knowledge and techne is found. The fact that now at a turning point of Occidental fate, if not the Occidentally determined fate of the earth as a whole, techne in the form of modern mechanized, mechanized technology is becoming the admitted or the not yet fully admitted fundamental form of knowledge as a calculating ordering is a sign whose immediate interpretation cannot be dared by any mortal. It's interesting that slightly later in the text, the notion of nearness comes up again that we've discussed um, last year and earlier this year or a couple of weeks ago, I think, it, it, he says it's interesting. Um, he says, if we consider that the essence of truth first opened itself up for the Occident in general, and then decisively for the ancient Greek world, we then recognize to what extent the fate that unfolded in the ancient, ancient Greek world is nothing bygone or antiquated, and also nothing ancient, but is rather th something still undecided and still approaching us. And Heidegger's next words might cause a stir, I imagine, in this reading group as he continues, toward, toward which we, the Germans, preeminently, and for a long time also, probably alone, can and must direct our thinking. Uh, there's a lot more to say, as I haven't even gotten to the question of the logic as episteme logicae uh, in connection with episteme physicae and episteme ethicae. Uh, which is uh, the subject of subsection B, but I will leave it there as we have a lot to chew on today and I'll open the floor for discussion. I wonder if anyone had any thoughts about why this section is here. I mean, why in a discussion about Heraclitus in the discussion about logic, I mean, thank you, Miriam, by the way, for an excellent introduction. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, uh, it, uh, it's not at all clear why we suddenly have our heads stuck in the cold bath of a discussion of of techne. I mean, the 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 German the headline in section two, Anzeiger des fraglichen Zusammenhangs, the the. Translation as an analysis regarding the questionable relationship between thinking and logic. But it, Anzeiger is more a report or an, even an exhibition. It's a, it's, it, it, um, because a, a formal legal report, a formal legal uh, statement from a court is an Anzeiger. This is, a, this is an end of term report rather than a, or end of semester report rather than a, an analysis, as it were. Did, did anyone, has anyone any thoughts about why? Obviously what he wants is to compare techne to episteme. And he says, 
that that he's talking about the differentiation between theory and practice. That's in page one in the in the subheading of, of section two of the seminar. So I think, of course, that's a hugely important topic: the differentiation between theory and practice. But um, I think he's introducing into the Heraclitus seminar, you know, something that exceeds uh, the interpretation of Heraclitus. I don't know what the idea is. Is it not simply that if 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 techne is understood in terms of logic now, or logic is understood in modern in terms of modern techne technology, then we need to go back to the root of the source for Heraclitus of what logos is. Again, he wants to, to talk about episteme physique, episteme logique, episteme ethique. Mm -hmm. And before he does that, uh, he needs to clarify the relationship between episteme and techne. Right? That's the basic idea. Mm -hmm. Is there a hint? I mean, this, this is 1942. The various, there are various versions of the um, Ursprung des Kunstwerks, the origin of the uh, work of art um, essay that are now all of them are now published. Uh, there's the one that that uh, was published for a long time, then it, it was revised and republished. Uh, oddly enough, in in a reclam edition initially in 1961, um, which ends with the discussion of the bringing forth of a temple. And there, right at the end of this first paragraph, we have the bringing forth of a temple. Thus, herefore bringing herefore bringing des tempers. Um, so clearly, I mean, I, my personal view is that Aaron's absolutely right, that, um, that this is a much more sophisticated discussion of techne than the one in GA19 in the Aristotle discussion, the Aristotle part of the, uh, of the Plato Sophistes lectures of 1924. But, but what, what has changed and what is this drawing on here? I mean, that also placed that... That lecture course also placed techne and episteme in a relation to each other alongside Sophia and Phronesis. It comes. Go on, go on. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it comes to mind um, techne as. Um, as uh, it is uh, uh, described in Homer uh, a fast description of the, the shield of Achilles. Uh, Techne is more uh, um, a product of the, the thought than, um, than a physical thing, a mechanical thing, or, or even something like a, a, a robot. Uh, it's um, it's um uh it's thinking it's the unfolding of of, of the world being that's what he, he shows Ephaestus doing a conference on Holderlin and um, two words uh came that I think that they are important here perhaps it's poikilia and uh, and I, I don't know if we have the thinking about techne here. Thank you, Anna Rita. I, I um there has been some discussion about the translation of Poikilia just recently. And I'm trying to remember. It's in um, it's in the new translation of Sapfo that's come out. And I can't remember it off my off the top of my head. And I'm seeing if it's close to hand in my in my study that I could uh, because it's it's a word that Sapfo also uses. I'm, I'm assuming she uh, from from Homer. Uh, the, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, but the, the, uh, the real question here, I think, also is what is the relationship of techne with the unconcealed? I mean, it, 
in a way, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we won't really get onto the discussion of Nietzsche until next week uh, in the second of the, um, of the Wiederholungen, because this question of the, it seems to me, this question of the relation to the, to the concealed and the relationship of unconcealment to concealment. So in 1924, Heidegger draws attention to how for Aristotle each, the, the, each of these modes, of which techne is one, are modes of adithoein, of, of speaking truly, of letting the true be true. And that, as it were, that what, it, what seems to be in the balance here is the questionable relationship between thinking and action. You know, you, uh, you, you may remember the, how the um, humanismus brief opens up. It says the question of action is still... Uh, still long undecided in Western thinking, he says. And that hints of how that can be. So uh, how that can be thought through, it seems to me, are present in this section of GA55. But it's the relationship of the unconcealed to the concealed that is absolutely crucial here. So in 20, 1924, the emphasis was very much, he uses again the example of the techniti, the architect, um, who, who has a plan already in his or her head to bring something forth, to make it, to, to put it in, to make a plan and to put it out into the open. But this reading of techein, um, of techne is very different. It's not a mere plan. This isn't the human being. In fact, I think this is what the polemic against Christianity is in part about, that we presume that in each case, techne always relies on a kind of creatio ex nihilo. But I remind us of the discussion of the set in section seven of the previous set of lectures that we, we just finished looking at, where Das Seiende uh, is in consequence of, a, of, of Das Seiende as it has been. So that the, uncon so that the concealed is not an ex a nihil, but is a plenitude that always allows for the further successive plenitude of what is present, Das Seiende, in each case, to be present. But in each case also, the human being is present, bringing the presenceness of, pre of what is present to being. So that the architect here doesn't create ex nihilo. And that's why I think would be my suggestion, why there's a reference to the temple. This, this takes place, as it were, under the aegis of, of something else. We might say, if we're Heraclitus, in service to Artemis. It's one way we might put it. There is the fragment which says, Zeus is won't and is not won't. Zeus is named and yet is not simply an arbitrary power as we've been taught that Greek gods are. And so, I mean, in that sense, this touches very much on Anarita's suggestion. Is I'm it gonna, a possibility? Sorry, carry on. I'm going to find that point, Elaine. Oh, I'm, I was going to ask: is it, is it a possibility that Heidegger's discussion of techne in GA 19, so 1924, 1925, is purely in relation to the extrapolation of, of the notion of techne in Aristotle? So, could he have this? What he has um, uh, laid out here in GA 55, could this be already in his mind, and he's simply discussing techne in Aristotle? Because he's he's clearly doing it in the sense that um, Aristotle, you know, is, is on the way to metaphysics, on the way to a modern notion of logic. So, could he have this understanding of technique already in mind in his critique of Aristotle? Personally, I don't think so, but others may disagree. I mean, I I think there is a shift. I just because I'm not too familiar with the literature between on techne between between the 20s and in the intervening 20 years I, you know and I did some stuff in the 30s but I'm not familiar with it so I just wondered if there's a uh, an explicit developmental 
uh, stage going on? I, d I mean, nothing springs to mind is the best I can. Well, I, I am sure this is over the term, so what I am going to say doesn't preempt what you, what you said, you know, but we're talking about 1944. Mm -hmm. This is a moment in which uh, there is grave concern in Germany mm -hmm. about what's going to happen mm -hmm. after uh, the war is over. Mm -hmm. I think Heidegger's son has already been taken prisoner by the Soviets. And I think Heidegger is anticipating uh, a post-war world mm -hmm, where the Soviets might have, in fact, taken over Germany. Mm -hmm. Uh, or part of Germany, as, as it indeed was the case. Mm -hmm. So he is, in fact, invoking here mm -hmm, the, the famous thesis on Feuerbach, mm -hmm, the notion that interpreting the world is over, now we have to transform it. Mm -hmm. Now, transforming the world is, of course, a technical uh, project, okay? So I think he may have been talking about that mm -hmm, uh, secretly, as it were, right? But because, you know, when, when, when in 1944, mm, in the context of a, of a war between Americanism, uh, Nazism, and communism, mm, you invoke the difference between theory and practice, mm, the reference to Marx is there, absolutely fully present, mm, or to Marxism at least. Mm. So it seems to me that we are mm, in that area. Mm. Of course, in, the, the uh, letter of humanism, as you remember, which is only written two years later, two years after this. Four, uh, four, four, three or four. Well, this is 1944, right? This okay, is like 1944. Uh, so the letter of humanism is 46, 47, right? So it's only two years. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems, and, and, the, and in the letter of humanism, he yeah, basically right. speaks about that. Yeah. Yeah about that clearly. The, the confrontation with Marxism is the absolutely uh, fundamental uh, issue of our time, mm -hmm. and we are caught between Americanism and communism and so forth. I, I think there's, I, I don't think I would go as far as you, Alberto, but I think there's a lot in what you say. I, I don't get in this text a clear reference to Marxism, but I do, I think there is a hint of of Leninism going on here. I mean, of, of total mobile um, And I mean, Heidegger knew well, that phrase of it came from Lenin. I mean, it's the phrase that Junger takes up in as a title of an essay, and then he uses it again in uh, the Arbeit of the Worker. True, but if you look at the paragraph that Aaron uh, uh, highlighted, which is in page four. The fact that now at a turning point of Occidental fate, what's he talking about? He's talking about the end of the war. If not the accidentally determined fate of the earth as a whole, mm -hmm. techne in the form of modern mechanized technology is becoming the admitted fundamental form of knowledge as a calculating ordering. He's talking about globalization, okay, which he anticipates will take place mm -hmm, uh, between Americanism and communism. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, uh, and he's denouncing that. He's saying, this calculating ordering is what Europe, uh, in fact, Germany, might oppose. Mm -hmm. You know, he has already said that in the seminar twice, in the Heraclitus seminar, mm -hmm. and he will repeat it in the letter of humanism. Mm -hmm. Globalization is ruled over by, by Terné. Mm -hmm. So what can we do about that? Mm -hmm. can, I, can, I, can I then invite you to connect that with my question? Because it, that's what he goes on to say here. He says then, does das Geschick, this mentioned tumor, which isn't humanity, he's not a humanist, it's humanities, that's a plural, und Völker, and of peoples or nations, is intimately rooted zu innerst gewürzeldest, in the Weidegen Bezug this mention, in the particular relation of, of, of man or of a human, towards the respective appearing or self-withholding essence of unconcealment, that is, of truth. In other words, the very thing you're describing, he is relating to the way that the way that truth un will now unfold, will the way in which what is unconcealed will relate to concealment and, and how conceal concealment um is brought into a relationship with unconcealment 
So all of that is, I think what you're, I think what you're saying is correct, but I think that it, it intensifies the relationship to Aletheia here. And I, I want to, I want, but I, but I don't think that we've, I, I, I want us to elucidate it. I want us to bring it out. Yeah. And so why Tecme? Tecme is, is, let's say, uh, is metaphysics, okay? Tecme is the result, the result of the history of metaphysics. Tecne is therefore the result of conventional thinking. Tecne is therefore the result of the forgetting of, uh, of being of Aletheia. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that's, where we're, that's why we're here. Uh, so everything he has said about the truth is then said is in what is said, you know? And the critique of logic as he's going to deploy it, uh, in, in fact, the critique of metaphysical logic mm -hmm. is completely connected to what you're saying but also to the need to take a step back from Americanism and communism, which for Heidegger are the two triumphant forms of metaphysical uh, polities in the West. But uh, to press you a little, I think you've described one side of techne, and I think that is the occidentally determined fate of the earth as a whole in techne in the form of modern mechanized technology. But this is techne taken in one way. But there is another techne at work here. There is another way of understanding techne, it seems to me. Yeah, I definitely think that Heidegger speaks about positive work of techne here. Techne has a positive function here. It's important for him to speak about a, a relation between episteme and logos. But episteme, he presents it as our ability to take a certain position uh, in front of a thing so that the thing could show itself to us, right? So it's po positing ourselves in a particular way to have a relation to a thing. But things are not constantly present and things are not objects. So what this sort of positioning ourselves has a special quality of unconcealment, the thing it requires to be brought to be to be brought forward to be unconcealed so this is a, a crucial element here i think to speak about tikne in the relation to episteme in order that we could at, um, at all understand what episteme means uh, in uh, in its difference from our modern uh, representations of 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 what epistemic means. So I think it's positively crucial for Heidegger to enter into this discussion of techne as what is essential to episteme. Could we go back, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, think that's, I think that's right. And in, in line with that, Eric, could we go back to Anna Rita's suggestion of the poikilo from um, so, Diane Rea has just produced an, a, a lovely new set of translations of Sappho, and she's she's someone who's been obsessed with Sappho most of her, her academic life, as far as I can tell. And she draws attention to Poikilofron uh, in the first fragment of Sappho, which she translates after long thought as iridescent. Um, but it can be, it has been translated as with thoughts of many kinds because of the fron in Poikilo Um, So here we have thinking and being iridescent woven together. Is that, is, is there a hint here for us, for techne? That is to say, if we have in mind Alberto's, I think, entirely correct analysis of the, the way in which techne has become consumed, it's or has been has the, its fate has been to drive the the unfolding of metaphysics, and there's, that's why I think there is that. He, uh, I remember putting this in my into my thesis uh, nearly thirty years ago. Techne haft. He talks about the the techno haft character of Christianity at work uh, in metaphysics, um, and then here 
we have techne as what might bring a temple to appearance, which would be poikilophron, iridescent, but with thoughts of many kinds. Is it this kind of fundamental relation with Fusis that we've been developing in the first, um, the first lecture series, uh, which is now bringing Techne into uh, relation with? Because he says, um, nature, especially as we, as we see it in the Greek way, is Fusis, is the self emerging and self occluding. Given this is so, we can, this is, sorry, this is page. Uh, two around the middle of page two um especially if we think in the greek race phusis is the self-emerging and self-occluding given that this is so we can easily see that phusis as emerging and occluding stands in relation to unconcealment and concealing and in a certain sense is unconcealment and concealing themselves so long as by phusis we think as is necessary nature in a more originary sense than what we than we are used to um he says these connections between phusis as emerging into the unconcealed and unconcealment itself never became clear and grounded in Greek thinking itself. The relation between the relationship between phusis and techne and the connection of both to unconcealment has yet to be illuminated, but rooted in this connection is the uncanny enigma that for the modern human there is a fate concealed within modern technology, one to which uh, we will never be able to respond properly through the merely purported master of technology. So what's then that fundamental relation with Fusis there? I mean, what fascinates me about the whole of this opening section is that each of the, each of the domains that he opens out, Ethike, um, I, I, uh, uh, what, are the, what are the three? The... Um, the uh, Logike, ethike, ethike. Um, each of these, he begins narrowly and then broadens them out um, hugely. And each of these has to do with their narrowness in relationship to logic and their broadening out with relation to, to being a genuine logike. Um, which I think is in line with what the question you're uh, in line with the question that you're asking, if I've understood it correctly. That there is a, in other words, we're not being driven to an analysis of the war, but rather the other way around, that the analysis of the war is driving us to see what we have not yet seen. I don't know if Alberto will, will be satisfied with that. No, yes, I am, because, you know, that's, I mean, that's his history, right? He's saying there is a way of understanding physics, mm, um, uh, and then there is another way of understanding physics, which is what has resulted in our, in our limited and reductive understand, uh, word nature, okay? Nature is the metaphysical version of physics, let's put it away. In the same way that modern technology is the metaphysical version of techne. In other words, there is a techne that can also be captured by essential thinking as such. Mm -hmm. And then there is the technique of the calculating ordering, mm -hmm, which of course reduces the, the, the meaning of the original uh, Greek term, mm -hmm. just like nature reduces the meaning of the original Greek term, uh, physics. Mm -hmm. So I think he's you know, creating the history. That's why he says Heraclitus is all important because Heraclitus enables us to glimpse into the essential meaning of these words that history has corrupted. I think that's the way he posits himself in relation to the relationship. Are we, are we closer to an answer now to why this section is here? So in other words, we begin with the narrowness of logic, um, but I noticed that the order in which he places these three discussions is, is we deal first um, with Fuzike. And then we deal, so episteme physique, and then we deal with episteme ethique, and then finally episteme logique, yeah. so that we work through each of these to discover, finally, that the logique, the logos itself, is going to require us to abandon its metaphysical constraints in order to understand how it's named. Yeah. For. And is this, is this therefore, is there not something here in the way he is proceeding that exactly 
places us in relation to the relation between the concealed and the unconcealed. So that what is unconcealed for us is the mechanized technology, the mechanized technology, which is grinding through life and is grinding through um, the towns of Germany at this very point uh, in the war, which is placing, in other words, placing the fate of humanities and people and uh, humanities and nations, as it were, in the balance. Isn't that being ground up, being also, um, uh, be being um, forced to confront what, what is being named here as das Seyende, what is present, the present situation? Because I noticed that each of these Episteme are related to Das Seyende im Ganzen. In each case, he raises Das Seyende being, but what is present as a whole, being as a whole. But, but it is what is being as what is present, Das Seyende im Ganzen as a whole. Um, it, that, that is, in each case, the concern. So in each case, um, the Fusike. Ethike, logike have the same demand, domain of concern, namely the entirety of what is presently present. In other words, we're not moving in a straight line here, or we're not traipsing through, but rather in each case we're, we are circling round on ourselves to be introduced to what is to be understood. And therefore, well, the, sorry, go on, John. Yeah, I, I, we haven't discussed the role of reflection in um, in this passage, um, and the way I was looking at what Heidegger was saying there, I mean, I wouldn't want to call it a methodological step, but he's trying to get his reflection in a certain mode. So, um, I mean, it would be safe to say phenomenologically that every human activity reflects the totality of beings from the perspective of that activity. Now, where those activities ossify into a particular uh, mode or a particular economy of taking the totality of beings, you cover it up again. Um, but Heidegger's reflection is trying to get at the totality of beings um, in this original and originary way. So um, I think we need, so that I'm trying to make my case for, we need to discuss what a Heideggerian reflection is that he runs through before he separates out the three kinds of episteme. Does the bending back help us? Yeah. In that we're not, as I said, we're not moving in a straight line. We're constantly being bent back. But if we take this from the perspective of subjectivity, Hegel's reflection always is bent back on the subject itself. I'm thinking of, I don't know if you know the, the Jena, the first sections of the Jena subjective philosophy of subjective spirit, where in each case the sub the, the individual becomes aware of itself. And he says this is, Hegel says this is tierish, uh, mere, mere conscious, be, becoming conscious. Because the, the move to being human and therefore subjective is the move from being conscious to being self-conscious. And then at the moment when we're self-conscious, each of these is an upbuilding, which is at the same time a, a reflection. So that we are, we don't watch, he says, in becoming conscious, we watch ourselves watching. And when we watch ourselves watching, so there's a bending back there, we, uh, uh, that's reflexion. Now here, Heidegger's not focused on the activity of the, of, a, of, the, of the subjectivizing mind, but rather there is still nevertheless a bending back. I, I mean, Eric's asking about reflexion and I think it's it's be, the reason I would suggest the reason why um, uh, um, uh, re, it's reflexion is because um, uh, uh, he's got Hegel in his sights would be my suggestion.
It's interesting, his characterization of um, Tecne at the top of page three of the, of the handout, where he says, thus Tecne does not mean a type of activity in the sense of an effect and of bringing forth, which is what we've just been going through in GA19, but rather we're preparing beforehand and keeping ready of the respective realm of the unconcealed into which something is brought forth and set forth, um, namely what is to be set forth. So, so do we understand techne in this sense to be a preparation for phusis, to, 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 to understand phusis in the originary sense of Heraclitus? Is, is techne in this sense... He used a word earlier in the text, but I can't think it's, it's something like in Stendekai or in Schlossenheit, something like that, a standing ready. Well, isn't this a retrieval of techne from the originary, where it's where it's close to fuses? And it also has to do a retrieval of reflection of, of you know, that thinking is thinking the to be thought. Um, so it's a different kind of of bending back. It's certainly not Hegel's self-reflection. It's not, it's not dialectical self-consciousness of seeing yourself in the see, conscious, you know, spirit seeing itself in the object of which it is conscious. He's really got to separate himself from Hegel here, like Lawrence says. I mean, in line with 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 that, and uh, but also still answering Aaron's question. The does um der eigentliche und meist verborgene griechische Sinn von Teko ist nicht das Machen und Anfertigen. The uh, proper and most conceal uh, most concealed Greek meaning of Teko is not making and finishing off, sondern das menschliche hervorbringen, but the human bringing forth von etwas, of something, in das Unverborgene. When we talk about, he then mentions this, um, he says, um, the, 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 the schöne Idee, the, the beautiful idea of, of bringing something into the, out into the world. Anybody who knows Teiko in Greek knows that, that what is also implied here is birth to bring something into the world, which nevertheless is itself. And the bringing into the world is not dominated by what brings it, what brings it forth. Surely, isn't there something of birth in this, of giving birth? After all, a tecta in Greek is a daughter, a one who has been brought forth in a, in, in a female way. I don't know if the if the, there is a male correspondent to that, but that's. The... I, I saw that as a bit of a, a piece, Lawrence. We talking. I mean, I, I again picked up on that bit about the bringing forth, as as Aaron's mentioned, and um, as a kind of conceptual preparatory, marshalling one's resources, thinking ahead. And I guess you could think of birth gestation. We use some of these terms about ideas as well as people. So I can see that all as part of a piece, really, and just seeing it as a kind of, even alludes to architect, doesn't it, as being one of the, the ways we see what techne means contemporaneously, perhaps. And when I think of an architect, I think of somebody, you know, with a massive piece of paper drawing out a plan and thinking about how they're going to go from a, an idea to a practicality. It's that kind of bridging, bridging step, which, again, I guess you could also see being pregnancy or, or gestation and birth between existence and non-existence. But there's a techne as a kind of process from idea to instantiation. Does anyone know those writings of Barbara Hepworth when she talks about sculpting? Mm. And she says that, she, she makes a comment that, and she's not alone in, uh, among sculptors in making this comment, that what she brings forth is already there in the stone. I mean, that's, it's that understanding of techne that I think is here rather than the architectural planning. And that's why I think in this case, he places the architect in the position of building a temple, i.e. doing what the God desires. I guess there's degrees of that, isn't there? I guess any artist might talk about, I have a process and a method, or I have inspiration and muse. And I guess there's a titration there that one might talk I mean, about. I'm, one thinking of, 
a mate of mine who's an architect goes nuts in London. He doesn't work in London because he says that in London, you know, we've we've simply allowed architects to to express their fantasies <laughs> rather rather than to bring buildings. He, he's a specialist in the history of architecture. And he points to how in many areas of London up until the 20th century, or certainly up until the late 19th century, what was built had to fit into its surroundings. Yeah. Now, you know, you look at the buildings in the city of London, for instance, you know, they are, they're meant to stand out. The architect gets to say something about what he or she, you know, make a statement. Um, and that yeah. that's that's what I you know I wonder if if that's what is going on here. And again, um, back to the um, what was it the, the the peasant shoes and the temple in framing the world, isn't it? I guess there is that wider contextual view sometimes for Heidegger. And I'm 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 exploring this because I'm trying to keep in view John Rose's bending back round as a question that is 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 I think also able to bring us toward where we want to be in this section. My connection with that, I mean, again, I, uh, I know um, Alberto mentioned it earlier, he, he still seems to have a lot of faith in the German people here. So I was just you know, bearing in mind what you said about Junger earlier, Lawrence and John talking about self-reflection on a kind of non-individualized level. He still hopes Germany is going to get out of this problem. And I guess that optimism there, he's going to teach logic to achieve this, just intrigued me, given where we were historically. Just, yeah, I agree that the events uh, give you the spurs to these questions. But his solution that Germany's going, Germany's going to solve it at this point, when they may have been part of the biggest uh, total mobilization technology going, seems a little bit um, strange. I don't know about other people. I, I mean, we have a tendency to read this as a kind of, hubristic German nationalism. We read him as if he were Hegel. You know, Hegel, I think Hegel really did believe that Germany and Prussia in particular was the answer to all global problems. Whereas I think in order to be genuinely German, you have to believe that that being, I've just read, for instance, Milan Kundera's rather lovely essay on the meaning of um, Eastern Europe. So we wrote it in 1984, it's about to be republished in a little edition in the UK, but it's it was published originally in English in um, the New York Review of Books in 1984. And, it's, it's, and he talks about the destiny of, a, of, of nations and specifically Eastern European nations that have been, have lived under the, the thumb of Russia, as far as uh, he talks about the Russianization of Czechoslovakia, um, uh, certainly after 68, but also even and then the Russianization of Poland for two centuries before that, um, and and the Eastern European experience is very different to in in the UK where we our borders have been fixed certainly for a thousand years, uh, arguably for even longer, um, and we're not so we're not used to permeability of borders and and fuzziness of borders but Kundera works with that fuzziness all the way through the essay and yet says in the middle of this that you know you as a Czech you know you're a you know you are a Czech when you are a Czech as it were and I wonder if Heidegger's references we're not tempted to misread Heidegger in the way that the accusation was made in the Spiegel interview. Oh, come off it. You really were an old Nazi nationalist after all. And actually, I, I, there is a more sympathetic way of reading it. If you read it more as Kundera describes um, the borders of the various nations of, uh, of a Europe that he regards to have been, he says our fate, he says at one point in this essay that our fate is to be Western nations who have always looked East. It's a fascinating way of describing the tension. Now, if you place that description into volume 40, into that those remarks about being in the pincers of Russia on the one side and America on the other, do you get a better, do we get a better understanding of, of Germanness here than one which simply sees this as a sort of angry, um, angry thwarted nationalism?
I didn't see it as he, angry. I think he has clarified, you know, what he means by Germany in those years in the in the Parmenides lecture in 1942, when he talks about completely changing our, our notion of politics and stop thinking like the Romans imperially, he says, okay? And he says, it is Germany and it is the German language, thanks to Helderling, that enables us to think of a, of a possibility of a non-imperial politics. In other words, I think that for him, Germany in those years is the possibility of a non-imperial politics for the West. Um, by non-imperial politics, of course, he means, you know, the politics that would be conceived by an essential thinker and so forth. You know? He's talking about, you know, a process of betrayal, I think. You know, we can, we can put it in those terms without moralizing the, the word betrayal, right? Physics is betrayed by the, the Roman notion of nature in the same way that FEK is betrayed by the Christian notion of morality and in the same way that logic is betrayed into a technique of thinking, forgetting the things themselves. So, so that's what he, he says, this is, this is Roman, this is, uh, this is the Occident, this is, this is our present time through calculating, ordering and so forth. But there is an alternative and for that alternative, we need to go back to the archaic uh, notions of that are hidden uh, in the present, you know, and so forth. You know. So yeah, so Germany is not for him. He's not using Germany in the Nazi sense. He's using Germany in the Helderlinian sense. If you want. Mm. I wonder if we could return to the, the three episteme, uh, the physique, ethique, logique, just because I, it struck me very forcibly in each of these that Heidegger returns us to this very concrete thinking that I, that I think gives us. So Alberto and, and Aaron, you both set for us the question of the relation between, of the, that he sets, of the what is the genuine relation between or what is what is even is it even a genuine relation between theory and practice? And there's that extraordinary statement for the Greeks: uh, the contemplative, the theoretical, is the highest form of practice. But that that's a shocking thing to the modern train to the mind trained in the modern way. And the answers <clears throat> seem to come in this second section. You know, there are those. There is that particular form of presence that emerging and submerging on its own accord and then i mean the english translation really i think is very awkward here it says das entstehen und vergehen in sich verwahrt which the english says uh, on their uh, on their own accord emerging and submerging on their own accord safeguard arising and vanishing but it's not safeguard but but rather keep within themselves that they that they they harbor so that in their own, and then he uses the example of the earth, the stars, the ocean, the mountain, rocks and waters. And I'm, I'm thinking of Sappho again, of the interpretation of Sappho's first fragment, which relies, um, Gregory Naj has a, has a very important, uh, he draws attention to the very important, one of the oldest interpretations of, of Sappho's poem, is that it's really a meditation on the relationship of the movement of Venus and the sun, because Aphrodite, as it were, has the hots for Apollo. So Aphrodite chases Apollo off to bed every day, and then she rises first ahead of Apollo as the morning star, um, and then Apollo comes out to shine. And that the whole of the first, uh, the whole of the first Sappho fragment turns on that interpretation of of the, she, she chases Apollo off into the concealed. We don't see what the two of them get up to when darkness falls, but we presuppose what they've been up to because she's up with the dawn uh, ahead of Apollo, scuttling off to do. Now, there are other Sappho references that make similar 
she taught uh, Sappho talks about going out to scatter during the day and being gathered up in the night. This is that's what that fervaren of Einstein and Fergian really means. This this incredibly concrete relation with the whole of the cosmos, which is a concrete relation with the whole of being in general. That's why I'm. I, I get very, I mean, I'm, I'm anxious about beings in general. I keep asking people, point me to the to a beings in general. What is a beings in general? This isn't, this is, this is the whole of what is present, pressing in on us and, and ordering our thinking. So that again, I want to place this in relation to, to Uncon to the concealed and unconcealment, that we are constantly, the episteme physique is, is cons a constant return to how the cosmos itself orders our experience of concealment and unconcealment. That's what I hear in that interpret that old interpretation of Sappho's first, um, um, first fragment. Just one example of how we, we live through not therefore just the rising and setting of the sun, but the relation of the cosmos to the sun in its rising and setting, and what that also holds within it, fervaren, harbors within it to give us. I mean, this is the complete, I've written an essay on this, this is the complete answer to Nietzsche's claim that the gods are, a, are an anthropomorphism. Because it reverses that, and that's the point I make in this is the essay. Uh, uh, um, it reverses this. It says no. The what what has been set up in a divine light, iridescent light, is that which leads us into an understanding of of the of the cosmic arrangement. So that it's in the it's not an anthropomorphism, but rather the human morphe is shaped by the cosmic morphine. Someone's asking, did Sappho know that the morning star and evening star were the same? Charles Kahn says that the Greeks didn't know that the morning star and the evening star was the same. I, I challenge everyone, to, I be, lots of people speculate on this. Of course they knew it was the same. I, 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 I mean, I, 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 I don't know, I, I, of course they did. You know, and it's Andrew. Andrew I, it's you. I, I uh, um, thank you for your question. I mean, I've I've been so frustrated at seeing these solemn reports in the same solemn way that I was told as a schoolboy that when Columbus sailed off, he genuinely believed the Earth was flat and he might fall off the edge of the Earth. That is that is nonsense. And I think we spread these nonsensical stories to ourselves. To, to, to attribute primitivism where it's not at all to be fine. I, I challenge anyone to write. If you can write, if you can show, write poetry as, uh, with, the, with the primitivism of Sappho's poetry, then you can hold to that belief that she had no idea that the morning and the evening star were the same. I would be my suggestion. Forgive me for a, a grumpy old aside. <laughs> Can I ask, sorry, Lawrence, your, your, your previous discussion about your essay was interesting because one of the things that I liked about this, this passage we've read and one of the things I was going to ask the group was about logic as an assertion. You sort of says a subtype of ethics. So if it is something, if logic is an act of asserting, what is it that is being asserted if it's not an anthropomorphization of our experience of presence? Is it, how, how does, how do we get from that? What's the kind of, again, it's back to that kind of, um, physics ethics relationship what's the uh, synergy or or mode of interaction between those two if logic is a subtype of ethics he says towards the end of this section this is the the discussion of the ethique the episteme ethique yeah with logic being about as, what assertion of humans and you say quite concrete stuff he says really yes I'm trying to find a page he mentions it um well, I think it's yeah, page six in page six. translation. So, well, yeah, begins one, to bring five, in two oh six in the German down and one five seven in the English down. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is a these are sets of grumpy asides that he makes quite often. He has it in for ethics, I think. Um 
um, of moral doctrine, a theory of virtue, or even a doctrine of values. Is that because they wanted him to write in ethics? Well, the French did, didn't they? The French yeah. got very grumpy about the fact that he never wrote in ethics. And yet, actually, I, I mean, I don't know. I find, I find Heidegger shot through with an ethical understanding. You know, he's he's profoundly respectful, with the exception possibly of Schopenhauer. He's profoundly respectful, even of the people he takes on. I can't think of any time when he's nice about Schopenhauer. But but otherwise. Bengler. Well, but I mean, he does discuss Spengler with, I mean, there's that delicious society once makes of Spengler. He says, Preußische Socialismus, Prussian Socialism. It's, it was the name of a journal that Spengler had something to do with. But I mean, it's, you know, as if what, how could you have a Prussian Socialism? It seemed to me that he was asking. You know. He asked an interesting question um, in, um top of page six of the handout where he says when will we when will we finally have the courage for once to think genuinely and tenaciously what would come to be if we i.e humans just looking at the gym could not think and say being and it says to be but i think it should be is being and is because then he talks again about the episteme fusike of the ancient greeks he says it's a way in an attempt to understand oh they've got beings as a whole that's i and ganson with an eye toward being, uh, an attempt to place themselves before that sign, that what is, uh, so that these, so that uh, may show themselves in the. I'm looking at the German. It's hmm. There's not much in the way of plural there. Uh, the entirety of Occidental thinking has not moved beyond this attempt. At most, perhaps, is deviated from it. It's almost a bit mellow from him. You know, it's not so much a. This has been the fate of the West, but the Greek question is, has still not been answered. And there is that, I mean, I think you mentioned it earlier, but there was that little tension of techne being a negative, but the hope of it being a positive still, that we could replay this history almost. And again, that's led to my thought about this, so this faith in, I mean, I take on board exactly what Alberto said, it's faith in a kind of Hodlernian German to Germany to do, to do it. Um, which I still sort of wonder why that might be the case, but I'm still. If we go towards the end, there's this extraordinary series of discussions. So this is the discussion of, in, of the Episteme Ethica, where he says the human is dwelling in the midst of being as a whole without however being its center in the sense of a ground that mediates and upholds it the human is in the center of being but is not that center itself is in the center of what is present but is not that center itself episteme physique and episteme ethique are an understanding of being as a whole a whole which shows itself to humanity and to which the human relates by holding himself to it and sojourning in it. And these are remarkable statements. Has he talked much so far uh, in other texts around this time of dwelling in the fourfold? Or is that to come? It, I mean, the fourfold doesn't get a public airing until 1949 in the Bremen lectures, but it's it's already being discussed in the in his own notebooks by this time. I mean, it depends how you interpret the, the, I can't remember when the first mention of Fierfalt is. John Rose may know, I don't know. Um, but, but already in the Beiträge, there are descriptions that are very close to what then comes to be the fourfold. There are, there are diag schemata, diagrams with uh, humanity, um, and divinity on one axis, and uh, earth and sky, uh, earth and um, <coughs> sky on the other. I mean, the fourfold is is already, I think, at work by now in in forty four. Right. Yeah. I mean, so I just, go on. 
Sorry. I just wanted to ask you a question, which which relates to that passage that you just quoted: "Episteme physique and episteme ethique are an understanding of beings as a whole." Could that be said of episteme logique and of terne? Is logos an understanding of beings as a whole, and is terne an understanding of beings as a whole, or is that precisely the difference? Well, you're right, he doesn't. There is no mention of Dasein. Yes, there is. From these short references to physics and ethics, we may surmise that now the aforementioned logic, the episteme logique, in some sense also connects to being as a whole. Here also, the remarked upon essential feature, the understanding that it somehow concerns being as a whole, is grounded in on that. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah but the, in some sense it's crucial here because you know in the review he will point out the huge difference between doing a bit Yes, and I mean mm -hmm. uh, we're sort of being disciplined in keeping out of the reviews because um, we had to. So uh, no that, that's why I bring up the question connected to in some sense. Mm -hmm. So I do we want to leave ourselves to clarify that next week, or are we going to break the rules and plunge into the next section? Break the rules. No, well, I think that we should discuss episteme ethique a little more. No? Okay, go on. Mm. Yeah. I, you know, I think this is a huge thing because for, in the letter on humanism, Heidegger says that he that if he, if he were to talk about ethics, it would be in the sense of an originary ethics. And this originary ethics is what he's pointing out here. You know, ethics as dwelling, as sojourn, you know. The word ethos, particularly in, in early Greek, apparently refers to the, the, the living space of an animal, you know, a fox or a bear, you know, that's ethos. Mm -hmm. So, Originary ethics is what is interesting for Heidegger, not the kind of ethics that has evolved into, into a moral doctrine, a theory of virtue, mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is hugely important because it, it affects everything, everything else, you know, in the, in the sense of the critique of metaphysics, you know, the critique of being a human is about, and so forth. Yeah. Is the clue to what you're asking about this the human being, their mensch, is in one respect the center, though in another respect not. Yeah. Is this not a reflection of Zeus is won't and is not won't? And similarly, we are, for each of us, I mean, that for each of us, we are always co-implicated in, in what it is, in what, in how and what being is. There is no being without us, as it were. I mean, this is a, a question that plagued the Heidegger circle a few years ago, and it still bubbles up to the surface every now and again. Old Tom Sheehan's Jurassic being. Um, but but the, the question here is really about presence. Because, you know, the, you can have all the Jurassic being you like in the sense that you can project yourself back to the Jurassic period, but, but that's a projection. Because what you are constrained to is that you are here now, from where you make and from which you make the projection. So the human is, and that is that not another way of saying the human is in the center of being, but is not that center itself. Der Mensch ist in der Mitte der Seienden und ist doch nicht die Mitte selbst. Well, Mitte has another meaning in German, the means. So the human being is the means of what is present and is yet not that means itself. You could translate that in this way. It's a, it's a slightly off translation, but it, it, it's there. Both in midst of and the means of. I mean, isn't, isn't, an, isn't an ethics therefore necessarily that central decentering that this is naming. 
that being in the center and withdrawing from it to let something be. The reason I'm pressing this is because that would be my description of techne. If you were to ask me what I think Heidegger really means by techne here, it would be to let something be and withdraw from letting it having and withdraw from having let it be. So you would be drawing ethics and technique closer together there, Lawrence, in that in that discussion. Uh, well, yes, I mean uh, exactly that 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 to bring about. I mean, I'm not a parent, but I've taught enough students to know that if you if you crush a student who's clever, or even one who's struggling, but by being overbearing, all you do is create fear with respect. But really, your job as a teacher is to give the person you're teaching freedom with respect to what it is you want them to know. And I'm assuming as a parent, this is even more imperative. Children who, children who have open and free and loving relations with their parents are the ones who the parent, and it's the, the agony of the parent is to find that passage into the child's freedom because the child cannot often cannot help you. It's you know, watching the friends of, the children of my friends, that they, they are, children are, are fizzing around in every direction, often whirling, not even sure what they really want. And the clever parent is the one who, who can open the path whilst not, so whilst finding a way to give them freedom, but in its constraints. Does that make any, am I talking twaddle here? I don't know. Many no, exactly. I can see bone knowing. I think any, any music clinician would realise that, it, yeah, structured freedom is what you need. Don't let things completely go well, otherwise they won't feel cared for and kept in mind. But conversely, too much structure is, is not so good. Yeah. Right. That's correct. I mean, I would say that working with children in psychoanalysis as a developmentalist and also consulting with parents over the years, part of the aim there is not to is to create the optimal environment or conditions to foster the natural development of the child from themselves and to bring it about. So it's not to interfere with or impose too much restriction that imposes upon the freedom uh, for them to, or he or she to develop their own independent autonomy over the course of time. So there's a lot in that, I think that I can find relationships with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, Gordon, you as a as a skilled practitioner, you make it sound as if it's straightforward. But I mean, I'm sure that it's not straightforward. I mean, for many parents, I think this is an agony, as it were. It's it's tough because they're also they're also human. They're also they get fed up and they get they get, right. That's know. right. But part of the effort in that is, you know, when I work with the child psychoanalytically, I'll also meet with the parents once a week, because I'm seeing the child four days a week or five days a week for many years or three to four years. It varies. But in the effort with parents, what's in vogue now and how it's talked or discussed is that the, the idea is that to be able to experience one's inner re reactions to reactivity, but rather than enacting it in a mode of acting on it, is to be able to reflect upon it and bring it up to a level of mindfulness or mentalization, and then transfer that or convert that into a meaningful discourse or some form in which the child can understand it developmentally in a system of meaning. So there's, there's, there's a tolerance of being able to tolerate one's own frustration or anger or provocations so that one doesn't react from that because that only perpetuates further problems down the road and currently as well. If mm -hmm. we draw this back to it being a techne, yes, then is this surely? I mean, if what if what I referring to what I was saying earlier and what I'm hearing from you now, you can't give a parent a rule book and say, "Look, follow these There's rules, and you'll get the perfect no. child." In fact, no. it's the absolute opposite. Exactly. The idea in that would be to, to help the parent to cultivate 
an understanding through the way that one relates to the parents themselves in the act of the conversation. So it's a, it's a way of actually being relating in the mode of what you're trying to help the parent to understand and also to transpose into his or her relatedness to the child. So it's certainly not an imposition or a technique or a rule bound format in different ways. It's more an experiential developmental process that the parent too is brought into through the experience of the relationship with me or the analyst itself. So that becomes a model through experience that then for them to convey with their relationship with their children, certainly. But the idea of the techne that you were talking about, what I find interesting in, in earlier going back to Freud, even how he talked about the effort of a psychoanalysis was the idea that it's more like a sculpture and then it's a, it's, a, it's a block of rock. And the idea is it's not imposing like on a canvas in art form where many forms of psychotherapy these days that are in vogue, different models. It's almost as if you have a different system of language and you're just simply substituting or imposing that onto the canvas of another picture that's already there. Where the analogy of, of sculpturing is in bringing forth is that you create the right grounds or conditions to allow that which is in concealment to eventually come through and bring it forth. It's a chipping away and chiseling away, but the form of what's already inherent in the marble itself as the, as the sculpture that's there is already inherent, implicit, and that is what you allow the conditions for it to come forth from itself. So there's a fusis overlapping, if you will, as I understand it from a lay person of a Heidegger in, in a closet to mm -hmm. tech, of the technique in the form of letting be, allowing, not interfering with. Aaron, I think I'm, we are, we are, I mean, we could go on, but I think... Yeah, no, I was really enjoying that. It's been a really rich discussion, and there's been a really good discussion in the chat as well, which I need to catch up on, which I'll post to the um, Slack group. I'll copy that in a minute. So I'll stop recording now.